if at some point in time uh, mom seems prompted to want to get up and to leave with one of the kids, dads, can you do me a favor this morning? Would you stop the moms from leaving? And would you take the little ones out so that the mothers can stay seated and be a part of Mother's Day service in here? Can you do that for me? Um, and if, if dad's not here, uh, I know we have plenty of parishioners and friends and family that are here that would be more than willing to assist. So let's keep our moms in here this morning. Two, um, kids. I want all the kids. If you are, in fact, I will include teenagers in the definition of kids. I know you're not kids. If you will take in the front of your pews here. Make sure I'm not a liar. There's, there's something called a communication card in here. Here's what you're going to do. Pastor Brett has three, three points to his message. And now if you can't write and spell, you'll have to have to ask dad or mom to help you out with it. But if you will write my intro story, what my intro story is about, or who it's about, and you will write my three points, and they're close, if you'll put that on a piece of paper, and then underneath that, you put your favorite candy bar and you turn it into me at the end of the service at the back Pastor Brett will buy you your favorite candy bar and have it for you next Sunday that way I know you're listening to everything I'm saying you got me now some of you adults know you do not get to fill this out for a candy bar and let me be clear we're talking about we are talking about regular size candy bars, not king size candy bars. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have you this morning. We're going to start off by showing a, uh, showing a clip of the Ruth movie and then, uh, and then introducing our subject for this morning. Sunday, I noticed a for sale sign in the yard. Ruth had never told me about it, because she knew I'd be upset, which I understand. But I went home and I started to think about how I wouldn't want to lose Ruth. She mentioned something to you about her moving back to Moab, and well, I just couldn't let that happen. I got into the Word and I prayed. I felt like God was telling me to buy the house. It was time to take action. So I did some research got the details. And then I called up the realtor and I told them I wanted to purchase the house. I signed a few papers and now I own the deed to Eli's house. That brings me to today. I wanted to see how excited Ruth was that the house was sold. I couldn't wait to surprise her and tell her I was the one who bought the house. I eventually found out that Ruth wasn't very happy with me. But I totally understand. You have every right to be mad at me. I should have talked to you about it instead of going behind your back. I'm sorry, Ruth. Will you please forgive me? Oh, Boaz, you have nothing to be sorry about. I overreacted. That was actually really sweet of you to do that for me. Oh, and these are for you too. Oh, thank you so much. He's a keeper. He sure is. <laughs> Let you two be my witnesses that I'm the owner of Eli's property. And I love Ruth dearly. Oh, Boaz, I'm so lucky to have met you. And Naomi, I'm so glad I decided to follow you. God definitely has a plan. He does. 
jazz roof. He sure does. Ruth chapter 4. Meanwhile, Boaz went up the town gate and sat down just as the guardian re redeemer he had mentioned came along. And Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and he sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, uh, then, he, then he said to the guardian redeemer, and they did so. Then he said, well, I'm reading the same line over and over again. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to our rel of relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, and I, I will know. For one who has the right to do, no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I re will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you will also require Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with this property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to another. This was the method of legalizing the transaction in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilon, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite and Malon's widow as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his families or from his hometown. Today you are my witnesses. What I'd like to, is to talk very briefly this morning about is redemption. And redemption, as we've mentioned in some of our lessons that we've studied and we talked a little bit about last week, is the idea of buying back. When we talk about it in spiritual terms, though, we're talking about something being saved. I want to share to you with you a story. Hint, hint, kids, this is the intro. I want to share a story about my sister, if I might, this morning. I was thinking of all the stories that I could share about, she would be the one that would probably be the best example. My sister was probably only six or seven at the time, and, and my, my dad, whether or not you know it, you may be visitors new to the church, he was a pastor. We had been invited over to a couple's home who were a part of our church. They had children that were similar to our age. They lived on Fort Lormie Lake. Uh, he had a little money. He was, a, he was a, a, a doctor in private practice, and he had a nice piece of land right on the lake. Well, it was, it was November. It was a cold November, and ice had already begun to form on that particular lake. And we were doing what kids do around water. We were running around tossing things into the water, finding dead fish and poking them with sticks, all the gross stuff that you can imagine kids were doing. Uh, my brother and I, I think, hauled a frozen fish out of the lake and tried to convince my dad that we should clean it and eat it, to which he informed me that probably would not be a very good idea or very healthy. Well, somewhere along the way, my sister, she was several years younger than us, and she was a tag-along. My brother and I only have about a year and a half difference, and we were getting irritated that she wouldn't leave us alone. Well, we had all got our own sticks we were playing with, and Chad took, took Jamie, my sister's stick, and just heaved it out into the water. Well, we ran off with our buddies. And somewhere in the process, my little sister reached out to grab hold of the stick, and she slipped into the icy water. As it would be ha happening, it was near the dock, and my dad and, and uh, Dr. Sternagel were there, and they were looking in the water, and Dr. Sternagel looked into the water, and all that you could see in that nasty green-brown water uh, was the vest that my sister had been wearing, my jacket she'd been wearing, and he goes, Brad, one of the kids has thrown their coat into the water, and he reached down. And he grabbed hold of that coat, and he pulled it out, and at the other end was my sister. I will never forget 
my brother and my mind's reaction of just shock, my sister coughing, trying to grab hold of air, talking about how she was screaming and, and, and trying, but nobody could hear her. And I will never forget the reaction of my mother, grabbing hold of her baby girl with all of her might and hugging on her. You know, of all the places that could have happened, it happened in the presence of a doctor. In all the circumstances that it could have happened, it happened with somebody who knew how to deal with the situation. Uh, I'm sure there, I remember her spitting up water. I know that Dr. Sternagel did something over top of her in order for her to get that out of her, out of her lungs. Of all people, and they wrapped her up in blankets, and mom did not let go of her baby girl. I would imagine this morning, with the moms that have gathered here, if one of your children in any way, shape, or form, uh, I don't care if they're two or if they're 22, were in any way in harm's way, you would take their place, you would do what it would take to save your children. Am I correct in that assumption? Last, last night we were watching that show, 600 Pound Life, and we were watching this lady's journey uh, of weight loss. And as we were watching it, um, it, we were, it was a, a kind of a to-be-continued year two. And she had a, a child who was severely handicapped. And all of a sudden, it goes to a scene where they're in front of a funeral home. And on the sign of the funeral home, there is a name. And we realize that they're attending the funeral for her child, 12-year-old boy. My, my wife, it was so shocking to my wife because we weren't expecting that reaction that she just burst out into tears right then and there. Uh, Mother's Day's approaching, her babies are on her mind, and there she's watching as a mother is dealing with the grief and the loss of her child. As we look at this story of, of Ruth today, we're looking at a story of, of a faithful journey of redemption. We're looking at a story where uh, uh, Naomi, uh, Naomi had lost everything. Naomi had lost her babies. They weren't babies, but she had lost them. They were gone, and, and all the future and everything she expected and went with them had been lost. Somehow, in the midst of that, Ruth, although it would have been wiser for her to have gone to her own family, chose to stay with Naomi. Today we see in the book of Ruth, we see just a small glimpse of what God is talking about when he is speaking about redemption. From the land of Moab to gleaning in the fields of Boaz to the threshing floor, the story of Ruth finds its first purpose in the guardian redeemer or kinsman redeemer. In the Old Testament, the kinsman redeemer were relatives who, who protected the needy members of their extending, extended family. They could redeem uh, they could redeem family in three ways. They could, one, they could buy back a relative sold into slavery. Two, they could, they, the family lineage of a deceased male by marrying the widow and providing an heir. And the final way was land of a relative that had been sold outside of the family, they could purchase back. In order to qualify as a kinsman redeemer, the land or the lineage it must fit into these qualifications. You must be a relative you must have the means of, of being able to redeem, and you must be willing to redeem. Boaz was the blood relative of Naomi. By marrying Ruth, he is not carrying out Ruth's name. He's, he's carrying on Ruth's name, not carrying on Ruth's name, but carrying on Ruth's widow's name. And, Na and uh, he's also caring for Naomi. Boaz was able to redeem Ruth and Naomi by means of financially providing for them, taking care of the land, but also providing an heir for Ruth so that the, land, the name could be carried on. And finally, we know, as we look at the story, that Ruth was willing. Let me give you my three points. My first point is this. Kids, are you ready? You got your pencils ready? One, Jesus, my friends, is our kinsman redeemer this morning. Did you realize that? <coughs> our first condition must be a broad relative. Well, Christ was. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and mercy. We must be, he must be able to redeem. Well, Christ was. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold 
from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as a lamb, unblemished and spotless. The blood of Christ. Second scripture, Hebrews 9.10. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. The only condition that is left for us is if we are willing to be redeemed. And the question remains for us this morning. Are we willing to be redeemed? Point number two, kids. Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, gives us promises through their redemption. He provides for us promises. Three promises I want to give you this morning. The restoration of life. And Ruth 4, 6 through 8, Boaz restores the life of Ruth and Naomi. Their life should have been over. Uh, Naomi should have found herself begging, and, and Ruth should have never have come along, and because of what her choice is, she probably should have entered a life that we don't want to think about. <coughs> but Boaz restored it. Christ restores our life. And this is the testimony God has given eternal life. And his life is in the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. The next promise is the promise that he gives us the gift of witness. In verses 9 through 12, there are those who have, surround, who have, who have witnessed the redemption of Ruth, the elders that were called together. Acts 1.8 calls us to be witnesses. We are to be the witnesses of Christ's redemption. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in both Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. I, I want to just pause for a second here and, and make one little comment. I could preach a whole sermon just on that topic. L let me say this. We have grandparents here this morning. We have your grandparents, we have your children here this morning. And, and parents, we have your children. We have three generations in our pews this morning. There's a lot of belly aching that goes on in the church about, about the fact that our culture is shifting. There's a lot of belly aching that goes on about how the generations are not staying together. I just want to say as a pastor, one of the reasons why we have lost our voice is because as a church we have chose to be quiet. Rather than create problems at a family dinner and talk about our faith, we choose to be quiet. Rather than talk about our faith in public places like work, we choose to be quiet. And because we have been quiet for so long, we have entered into a, a culture and society that no longer wants to hear or listen to us. But God has given us the ability through His Son as our kinsman and redeemer to be His witness. Third promise. New life. Ruth had a new life with Boaz, and we have a new life with Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Or Romans 6, 4. We are therefore buried with him through baptism and into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. Okay, here's my third and final point. Christ, our kinsman redeemer, restores all. Christ, our kinsman redeemer, restores all. I love my mother, and, and I'm glad my, in some ways I'm glad my mom's not sitting in the audience. I might get a little emotional, and I don't have to worry about getting emotional this morning, because I'm not going to be looking her in the eyes and telling, telling these things. My mom did a lot for us as kids. My mom did a lot with, with, without a lot so that we could have. Uh, my mom, uh, my mom uh, was a few, a few credits short of, of a degree from college. But she chose to stay at home and support my father as a minister. And, and she chose to raise uh, us kids. And we pinched pennies in order to be able to pay for things. My mom didn't always make the wisest of decisions. There was a Sunday that, or not a Sunday, a week that rolled around where... Uh, some of her parents had, had given and passed along to us silver dollars. Now, my mom would have been wiser to have taken those silver dollars and gone to the local pawn shop or coin store and, and sold them and got the money for them. 
But what my mom was concerned was the fact that there was no milk in the refrigerator for her kids. And though all unwise, in order to take care of her kids, she took those silver dollars, and I'm sure the cashiers cashed those out as soon as they got them. She bought milk for her babies. With all the sacrifices my mom has done over the years, with all the things that she has done without, all my mom is able to do with all her sacrifice is sustain life. What I want to tell you this morning is that our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, with what he did in his sacrifice on that cross and dying for our sins, does much more than sustain life. He redeems life. He restores life. He wants to restore you. He wants to restore your family. He wants to restore your people. Matthew 18 or 28, 18 through 20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Acts 1, 8 again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Our, our Lord wants to restore you. Our Lord wants to restore your family. Our Lord wants to restore our community. I was reflecting on last Sunday's uh, annual meeting, and I was reflecting on some of the things I wrote. Uh, there's a, a lot of... Uh, Chuck's not here this morning, so I'm going to quote Chuck Edwards, the great theologian Chuck Edwards. And this is what he said. Preacher, Rush ain't like other churches. Quote. <laughs> you know, I, I, can go to, uh, I can go across the district and I can talk to pastors about different things. And I can tell you what their wisdom is. Uh, I can tell you what they would probably tell us in search of certain situations. I was thinking about this last year. Um, if I was to tell my pastor friends, hey, pastor friends, we're going to, we're, we're thinking about, we've got to revitalize our, our evening service. We've got so few people attending. And we were thinking a great idea would be to start a children's program. My pastor friends would have said, pastor, pastor Brett, evening services are on the way out. That's something of an old tradition. You need to let that thing go and let that thing die off. But we didn't do because we're not like other churches, are we? And we now have children coming on a Sunday evening program. Moms and dads, I can't wait till you drop your kids off and you stay for Sunday evening service. I'd love to have you there. My, my friends, it, you know, they would have told me, I know we have gone on and on about the Ruth movie. I just, I sometimes wonder when you're in the midst of the miracle, do you witness, or you understand the miracle that's taking place in front of you? I don't care that it's Richie Johns that filmed the film. The fact that it actually happened means that you were open to, to acting. Many of you showed up. Uh, I did not know Carrie Rooks was such a good actress. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the thought was, when I originally thought about it, I thought, you know, we could do this for our local church. It will, it will be, it'll be all right. We'll, we'll do it, and we'll see how things go off. I didn't expect there to be all these views on Facebook, 11,000 plus views just on Facebook alone. I did not expect, we expected we were going to rent the theater out, have a big church thing, right? And then come back. Well, people watched the thing and then all of a sudden there were other people besides our church that wanted to see the movie. And 10, episodes, 10 times later, it's been shown 10 different times over there and five of the 10 showings have sold out. Who would have thought Rush Community would have done that? You know what? Rush is not like other churches. We are different. And I want to tell you, if you're visiting this morning, God's at this church. And it isn't because of Pastor Brett. It's because God has always been present here. And this is a great place for your kids to come Sunday after Sunday and be influenced by the men and women that are part of this church. If this is your first Sunday here, I hope it's not your last. We relish the fact that we have the great opportunity to influence your kids and your youth as they 
grow up and understand what it means to be adult and understand what it means to live the Christian faith. I, I want to I close this morning out in a unique way. And I, I don't have a long sermon intentionally. I knew there was a lot going on. Um, we're not going to do an altar call like, like I had thought. I, I, I want to do it this way. Um, if you're here this morning... And I'm going to ask if the worship team would come up and play a song for us. If you're here this morning, and you are as wonderful as everything is, let's be honest, sometimes in our families we have, we have strained relationships. It's Mother's Day. And I'd like to think that all you guys are headed back to see family and everything's going to be great, but I'm aware that there are some situations that's not the case. Maybe, maybe it's not an issue with you. Maybe it's an issue with somebody else. Maybe it's, maybe it's your parent. Or maybe it's your child. I, what I'm challenging this morning is this. If you have a strained relationship, if you have a relationship you would like to see restored, uh, my prayer is that the God of Ruth, who performed the miracle and resurrecting a family that should have been should have been no more, has the ability to resurrect a relationship in your families. You got a son or a daughter you want to renew a relationship with? Are you willing this morning to put that in the hands of God? And, and just as we anoint people, just as we anoint people when, when we're praying for healing, we're praying for healing of a relationship this morning. If you'd like to be a part of that, I'm going to have everybody stand. Richie, what song are we going to sing this morning? I'm going to sing Broken Vessels. Come up, I'd love to anoint you. I'm going to turn off my mic, and I'd like to have this moment with you if I can. All these pieces, broken and shattered, in mercy gathered, mended, and whole. Empty-handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free. I've been set free. Was blind, but now I 
can see the love in your eyes laying yourself down raising up the broken to life grace how sweet Just her voices. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I can see you now. Oh, I can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down, raising up the broken to We want to close this morning, and um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, many of you are aware uh, of, uh, of the accident that happened at Alaris. And so in closing, I'd, I'd just like to pray for their families. I'd like to also lift up uh, Bill Armstrong, if I might, this morning. And, and Jeannie, you have a, a grandson that you're praying for as well who has uh, been diagnosed with a form of cancer. So let's lift up these people. Lord, as we come to you in closing, uh, we're aware that uh, we are, we're called to our community. We look at the story of Ruth and Boaz, and Boaz brought restoration through uh, providing an heir to Ruth and taking care of property that was going to be sold off. But you've done the miracle of miracles, Jesus. You have bought us back from the slavery of sin. You've become our garden redeemer in a completely unique way. And Lord, as we look at, at what that means, that means that we have been placed here for a purpose. Uh, we're not just a church. Uh, we're not just a social club, Lord, but we become a place where people can find restoration and can have the bondage of sin broken, Lord. Help us to be that. Lord, we pray that you'd be with Bill Armstrong. We look at what that man has endured over the last few months with the loss of his wife, the loss of his daughter. Uh, it's been rough. And, and now for him physically to find himself unable to leave bed... Uh, and not be able to get out like he wants, that's even more difficult. And I know what the doctors have said. Uh, they're merely going to be doing a procedure to deal with the pain. It's not really going to bring healing. But I serve a God of miracles. And so as we stand here this morning, we're not praying just for pain to go away. We, we are praying for, for something that can't be healed to be healed, Lord. We are praying that you will bring restoration to his physical body and allow Bill the, uh, the ability to be mobile and be able to see friends and family as we want and as he wants. Lord, we pray that uh, you'd be with this grandson, this eight-year-old boy who has uh, been diagnosed with a form of cancer, Lord. We pray, that you would, we pray that you would bring healing to his body. And finally, more, 
this morning, Lord, we think about those men that are at Alaris. We think about the injuries that they have endured physically. We think about the injuries that the man who is operating the vehicle is enduring emotionally. And there's a lot of hurt and pain out there. Lord, I don't know what kind of contact those men have with the church, but I know of all the places they could provide, they could provide healing in the sense of a hospital and a psychologist and all that, Lord. The real healing that comes from, comes from you. It's an emotional healing. It's a spiritual healing, Lord. We'll let the doctors mend the wounds, Lord, but Lord, we would pray that somehow, whether it's Rush or some other church, that they would be involved and they would love those men and they would love on their families and that they would begin to experience what it means to have a Savior who is our, our kinsman redeemer by the name of Jesus. Finally, Lord, as we dismiss for Mother's Day and we think about the broken relationships we have, and many of us have them, maybe we don't want to talk about it, but we're not where we want to be in speaking terms with our children. Maybe we're not in speaking terms with our parents. And it's not necessarily our fault. It might be something that the other person has done. But there gets to a point, Lord, where we got to let these things go because what's important is relationship with them. What's important when, when we have such a limited time here on earth is not to bicker and fight over things that are very trivial. What's important is to be able to love one another and have a relationship. And when these family holidays come around, to be able to love one another, embrace one another. Lord, I, I pray more than anything that you would enable us as we find ourselves in bondage over these relationships, as we find ourselves in bondage over things we've said or done that we shouldn't have, to be able to break free of them. And as we leave for, for, to celebrate Mother's Day, we would begin the process of reaching out. And we might reach out and be pushed away. But it's got to start with the first step, Lord. Allow us to begin to bridge that great chasm that has come between us and those that we love so that once again we can love them as we've been called to love them and they can love us in return. Lord, we believe in the relationship of the, of the kinsman redeemer. We believe in the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. And God said, amen. I pray I start turning. Oh.